Hello. Welcome to the webinar on the introduction to the mathematics of gun violence. This webinar is hosted by the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis, which we locally call NIMBUS, here at the University of Tennessee. NIMBUS is supported by the National Science Foundation. Uh, it's also hosted by one of our affiliated centers, uh, DISOC, which is the Center for the Dynamics of Social Complexity here at the University of Tennessee. And we're very pleased to have you here for this activity. Um, so uh, I am uh, your moderator for today, uh, Louis Gross. I'm the director here of the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis, as well as a faculty member uh, at the University of Tennessee. Uh, uh, a few preliminaries here for all the participants. You will be getting an evaluation of this webinar uh, through our National Institute for STEM Evaluation and Research, which is also an affiliate here at the University of Tennessee. Um, and we hope that you will uh, uh, fill out that evaluation. We believe here at Nimbus that we should evaluate all of our activities. I will tell you that uh, the hosts and, and moderator will not uh, know who you are if you respond to this. Uh, it is anonymized for us by the National Institute for STEM Evaluation and Research. We will be posting uh, the recording and slides uh, for this webinar on the conference website, and we will give you that website at the end of the uh, webinar when we uh, discuss questions. Um, also, this uh, webinar, uh, although it's uh, supported by the National Science Foundation, any of the opinions expressed are the opinions of we, the host and moderator, and not uh, the NSF. Here's how you interact today. Uh, you should have a Zoom screen, and uh, there is a little uh, box that you can press to chat. That will bring up a chat window. That ch chat window allows you to uh, basically, send a note to we, the panelists. Uh, this is set so that the uh, questions only come to the panelists. Uh, if you have something you would like us to display to all of the attendees, just uh, signify that in, in your note to us, and, and we will copy it and send it to all attendees. Uh, and you can just type in the area that says type here uh, to uh, send a question or comment. So our presenter today is Shelby Scott. Uh, Shelby is here at the University of Tennessee, uh, and her PhD effort is supported by the National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship Program, uh, under which she is carrying out a set of an anal analyses of gun violence, uh, and particularly focusing on a collection of mathematical and computational models to analyze uh, gun violence. Um, so Shelby, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to do this, uh, and uh, it's all yours. All right, uh, thank you so much, Lou, and thank you all for logging in today. First of all, I want to go over the objectives of the Mathematics of Gun Violence Workshop, which underlies this webinar. Many of you uh, may be attending the webinar, and for those of you who are not, welcome to the webinar. I hope you learn a little bit and are able to get further engaged in the subject matter. So the objectives of the workshop are to first of all, review the existing approaches on the mathematics and modeling of gun violence. We also want to identify and prioritize the areas in the field that do require further research. Additionally, we want to develop some cross-disciplinary collaborations to gain new perspectives, Gun violence does not exist in a single silo, and therefore, nor should our research. And also, eventually, we would love to suggest some research and data collection that could assist evidence-based policy recommendations in the future. For this webinar in particular, we're going to focus more on the first two objectives, and in the workshop, we hope to focus more on the second two objectives. The specific objectives of this webinar are to first of all review some of the terminologies surrounding the mathematics of gun violence, and then to look into a few of the existing gun crime and gun violence models. 
And this is simply a subset of the models that exist out there. There may be others. If any of you have great references that you think have been left out or are very notable, please feel free to send them along in the chat box and I would love to be able to read them. First of all, I'm going to go through some of the terminology. I wanna first think about the objectives of models. We're talking a lot about object objectives to start out. And uh, the main objectives of models in general are first of all, to provide a framework to assemble bodies of facts and observations. And this allows us to standardize data collection in some ways. Models also allow us to clarify hypotheses and chains of argument. They allow us to identify key components and systems as well as invest, uh, allow investigation while accounting for societal or ethical constraints. And this objective is a, a major concern to research in gun violence and gun crime. They also provide the ability to consider spatial and temporal change simultaneously, as well as prompting tentative and testable hypotheses. Additionally, they serve as a guide to decision-making in circumstances where action cannot wait for detailed studies, which is also a major focus of the types of models we'll discuss here. They provide a means to look at general patterns and trends. And finally, they can be used to predict how a system will behave under different management and then control the system to meet some objective, which in thinking about creating some evidence-based policies, this is also a major use of these models. Now, models do come with trade-offs. So you can have a general model, a precise model, and a realistic model. And at some point, you do have to uh, make some trade-offs between these different characteristics. So no one model can do everything. Models will leave certain things out or be unable to answer all questions, but that does not necessarily mean that they are not incredibly useful. Before a model is even considered or even thought about being created, it's important to think about how the model will be evaluated. So because we have these many objectives for models, we should expect there to be multiple criteria for determining whether these models are useful or not in order to answer specific questions. So even before a model is developed, criteria should be established for evaluating its use. And these evaluation procedures should account for a variety of things, including the constraints of the data available, the effort it will take to carry out the model, the resources, and the computational power required. These evaluation criteria should be taken into consideration when assessing methods, the level of detail, the scale of the model, and also what can be ignored when deciding on a model. Mathematical models in general elucidate key features of a system and ignore what is not relevant to the specific question to be answered. So you may have a real world problem that you then define in a specific way, which can then be translated into a mathematical model. And then this mathematical model can be analyzed and interpreted in order to give some insight to the real world problem. It's important to note that modeling is an iterative process. So we may create one model and then figure out that the question we asked may have other details we'd like to include. And so we continue on in this process until our objectives are met. There are also statistical models, which many say are a type of mathematical model. They can be defined as a method of determining the properties of a given system in terms of relationships between system components. So you have a population that produces some data, and with that data, you can perform an exploratory data analysis and come up with some probabilistic ideas surrounding uh, underlying statistical distributions and then create inference from that. And again, this is an iterative process. So you may take that inference and find a new subset of the population's data to then redo this process on in order to answer a number of different questions. One way to consider different types of models is to think about the characteristics of their state variables. So you may be able to think of a model as being either deterministic or stochastic, continuous or discrete, dynamic or static, and then a combination of each of these six factors. So deterministic models uh, assume the outcomes are completely determined by the model. Meanwhile, stochastic models focus on the probability distributions of various outcomes in the model. Continuous uh, models and characteristics allow variables to change at any point in time, 
while discrete models track changes to variables in discrete and individual time steps. And I'll note that with continuous and discrete, this can also be uh, this can also be a part of space as well as a part of the state variables. So not only can you have a model that is continuous in time, you can also have a model that is continuous in space or that has continuous state variables. There are also dynamic models that describe how a system changes over time and then static models which look at the state of the system at only one point in time. In terms of some examples of mathematical models, and these are only two examples in a wide variety of both types and examples of models, the classic kermack mckendrick ordinary differential equation model of infectious disease spread is deterministic, dynamic, and continuous using those definitions from the previous slides. And this looks at how the number of individuals in a given population changes over the course of an infection. And then you have models like this uh, toy Markov model of sentence structure that's stochastic, dynamic, and discrete. And so you can kind of follow this flow diagram in order to figure out the probability of moving through certain parts of the sentence of one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. And again, this is a toy model, but there are far more complicated and more uh, widely applicable versions of Markov models. Moving to statistical models, this is only a small representation of the types of statistical models in existence, but they are a number of the ones that are often used. So regression models determine relationships between two or more variables, while time series analysis analyzes patterns in a sequence of observations over time. Then we have Markov models, which I listed as a mathematical model, but there are underlying statistics in there, which is uh, integrated in the fact that a lot of statistical models can also be seen as mathematical models. And so these models are used to explain cases in which the future of a process depends only on the present and not on the past. Spatial models assess the relationship between events and their spatial distribution. And then with multivariate statistics, we can consider simultaneous interactions between a number of different factors. Looking at a few examples of statistical models, on the left you see a very basic regression. And this is something that we often present to our Statistics 1 students and maybe even introductory biology students to show a difference between correlation and causation. So you see that the drowning rate and the amount of ice cream eaten are related to one another, but that does not necessarily mean that they are, uh, that one causes the other. On the right side, you see an example of spatial modeling, and this is the species distribution of endangered crayfish in Germany. And what's interesting about this is that the data set does not have the complete information about where each of these individuals are, but through using statistical modeling, we can determine the likelihood of these crayfish being in a given location at a given time. Moving on to gun violence and crime in the United States, and this is specifically in 2011, the um, National Institutes of Justice state that 4,067, 321 persons were victims of a crime committed with a firearm in 2011, and that firearm crimes comprised 8% of all violent crimes that there were 11,101 firearm homicides specifically, and that firearms were used in 68% of murders, 41% of robbery offenses, and 21% of aggravated assaults. And while this is simply a snapshot of what 2011 looked like, looks like, the graph presented shows the changes in both suicides and homicides over time in the United States. So some history behind gun violence research. In 1993, Arthur Kellerman, who ironically enough went to my undergraduate institution, published a paper titled Gun Ownership as a Risk Factor for Homicide in the Home. And what this stated is that there is a correlation between gun ownership and a higher risk for homicide in the home. In 1996, Congress passed the Dickey Amendment, which said that none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention may be used to advocate or promote gun control. And this in 2012 was extended to also cover the National Institutes of Health. 
So we have two large agencies that have limited ability through their funding to carry out research on gun violence. In 2017, Stark and Shaw presented a study which said that gun violence is the least researched cause of death and the second least funded cause of death after falls, which you can see on the graph to the right. Looking into some of the existing gun violence and gun crime models, we want to break them down into a few different types of categories. And I will again state that this is not all of the literature out there and that we strictly wanted to look at gun violence and gun crime. So there are a number of models out there about policing methods and about other types of crime, but for the purpose of this webinar and due to time constraints, we will strictly be focusing on those models dealing with guns and gun crime. Starting with how we analyze spatiotemporal distribution of gun violence and gun crime. There are a number of different spatial statistics approaches. So first of all, there's the idea behind using distance matrices and K functions to determine spatial dependence. And a question that could be asked with this is whether there is a concentration of shootings near schools. There are also methods using Bayesian spatiotemporal point processes that are attempting to distinguish between clustered but non-diffusing gun violence and clustered gun violence resulting from diffusion. And diffusion here means spreading out from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. We can also look at some network-based computation methods on a spatial scale in order to do things like estimate the strength and extent of the spatial influence of physical features on gun violence. And in this paper in particular, those physical features were things like liquor stores, convenience stores, and a number of other public landmarks that may promote or reduce the amount of gun violence in a given area. In terms of cluster detection, there are ways to investigate whether different homicide types have different patterns of clustering and movement. And we are going to get a little more into the idea behind cluster detection. Hotspot analysis is a major part of gun crime identification and of gun crime prediction. And there are a wide variety of methods used. So one that can be used is the marked point process. And so the equation down at the bottom looks at the intensity of gun crime um, in a given area based on the location, which is the X and Y, and the time, which is the T. And this also looks at short-term and long-term patterns of risk, which is incorporated into that equation with that M term. Also, growth curve regressions can be used in order to uncover how some distinctive developmental trends in gun assault incidents can occur at street segments and intersections. So the map on the left looks at this spatial distribution of microplaces, where we have both stable and volatile concentrations of serious gun violence, particularly in Boston. In terms of some of these other methods of cluster detection and analysis, risk terrain modeling can be used in combination with environmental risk factors in order to investigate how we can forecast gang violence and predict future gang assaults and gang homicides. And this study was done particularly in the Hollenbeck Community Policing Area of Los Angeles. But what these risk terrain models do is that they look at how you can layer different risk factors in order to determine the areas that are most at risk of experiencing these events. There are also ways to compare these certain methods. And so there are times in which one model may be more appropriate than another. And we have a few comparative studies that look at how one differs from the other and therefore can serve as some information of when it might be appropriate to use some hotspot methods versus using risk terrain modeling. Moving on to the impacts of constraining gun availability on violence and crime, and this is something that is fairly specifically highlighted by the Dickey Amendment as being um, unfunded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the NIH, and so therefore there are a limited number of studies done, particularly on this, at least in my literature search. But uh, there are a few studies that have been put out 
So uh, game theory has been used in order to construct these simple victim-criminal interaction models that can provide insights about the desirability of gun crime legislation. And so what game theory does is it allows us to test a different set of strategies against one another to determine what would happen if one player in a game plays one strategy versus another player playing another strategy. So these types of models were used again in order to present a mathematical framework that analyzes the debate specifically about gun control. There have also been some statistical analyses done about gun constraints. So there, uh, in terms of regression models, there have been two stage least squares regressions done to determine the effects that gun control restrictions and gun prevalence have on rates of violence and crime. And note that that study was done in 1993, which was before the Dickey Amendment was put in place, and that means that the data used may have been outdated. There are also studies which use limited information maximum likelihood regressions in order to examine the relationship between gun availability and crime in a cross-national sample of cities. So while there are a number of studies that look at a particular city or a particular area of a city, like we saw in some of those spatial statistics models, there are also studies that look at a cross-national sample of cities. We can also look at some time series analyses in order to determine whether the restrictiveness, permissiveness of these state gun laws and gun ownership are associated with mass shootings. There are also a number of models that look at the effects of population characteristics on violence and crime. And these can be done at a number of levels. They can be done at specific community levels. They can be done at larger scales and at um, more global and national and nationwide scales. In terms of some of the models that have been done, uh, a probabilistic contagion model looked at the ability of a social network epidemic model to predict who will become a victim of gun violence. So the idea of using some of the ideas and tenets from epidemiology and looking at social network spread in order to determine who might be the next victim of gun violence. Similarly, with network modeling, you can examine the role of neighborhood level criminal networks in shaping the distribution of crime throughout cities. So looking at how individuals are connected to one another and how that helps to perpetuate gun crime or helps to reduce gun crime. In terms of some of the statistical analyses, there are a number of multivariate statistical methods that can be used in order to examine the epidemiology of non-fatal firearm violence on the west side of Chicago, and also to assess the relationship between perceived collective efficacy its subscales of social cohesion and informal control and how those are related to exposure to gun violence. So how are the ideas that exist within a community connected to exposure to gun violence in a given area? In terms of using trend analysis and regression, we can examine specifically Chicago crime data to see if there's evidence of a Ferguson effect which is an increase of crime following the riots, excuse me, um, following the Ferguson riots, and to see if the availability of illegal firearms can explain the violence rise in Chicago. So for those of you unfamiliar with the data, Chicago saw a massive spike in gun crimes between the years of 2015 and 2016. And there are a number of individuals that are trying to determine the reasons why that spike occurred. We can also use these methods in order to examine the relationships between isolated youth, illegal gun availability, structural disadvantage, and Southern culture with gun crime. So this is not only a question of socioeconomic conditions, this can also involve cultural norms as well. And finally, we can look at some machine learning and random forest algorithms in order to identify an optimal set of predictors for urban interpersonal firearm violence rates using a broad set of community characteristics. And this study in particular did look at, at a lot of those socioeconomic conditions and then determined which factors best predict uh, or best attempt to predict uh, interpersonal firearm violence rates. Focusing particularly on this contagion model study, 
which explores whether or not contagion is evident in more high profile incidents, such as school shootings and mass killings. What, uh, what occurred in this model is that they wanted to use some stochastic contagion model in time. And so this is looking at temporal trends in mass killings and school shootings. And so they wanted to look at the relationship of things like state prevalence of firearm ownership, mental illness, and these state rankings of firearm legislation, and see these relationships to the state incidents of mass killings, school shootings, and mass shootings. And so this diagram over on the right looks at the correlations between these things. So you can find that there is a correlation between the prevalence of firearm ownership and the school shootings in a given area, and then there is a negative relationship between the gun law legislative rankings and the mass killings with firearms. So these models can be created, and this model in particular found that mass killings involving firearms are incented by similar events in the immediate past as our school shootings. So there is this idea behind high profile incidents causing a temporal, not necessarily causing, being related to a temporal contagion of future school shootings and mass killings. And finally, looking at intervention attempts and their impacts. So there are a number of different methods of intervening in gun violence and gun crime. And so one abstract way to look at this is through an ordinary differential equation model. So what this study hoped to do was to introduce a susceptible transmitter victim epidemic model to explore the impact of violence interruption on the spread of violence. So there's a class of susceptible ind individuals that may move into the class of violence transmitters, and then that class of violence transmitters may move into gun assault victims, and there's movement between those classes as well. And what the study hoped to do was to determine what happens if we try to reduce the number of violence transmitters in a given population and how that affects the number of gun assault victims. Moving on to some of the statistical analyses that have been done, autoregressive integrated moving average or ARIMA models have been used to both test the impacts of project longevity on group involved shootings and homicides in New Haven, Connecticut, and also to identify the impact of the strategic subject list pilot on individual and city level gun violence, and also to test some of the possible drivers of results. So this first study was done in New Haven, while the second study was done in Chicago. There are also uses of multivariate and exploratory structural equation modeling, or SEM, in order to measure some of the perceived norms and viewpoints regarding gun violence in response to implementing the Safe Streets Intervention in Baltimore, Maryland. So while other studies may look at the prevalence or the occurrence of gun crime and gun violence, this study looked at the attitudes surrounding gun violence and gun crime in a given community following the implementation of the Safe Streets Intervention. And finally, Bayesian hierarchical models can be used to test the relationship between neighborhood misdemeanor policing and homicide. And again, I'll mention that there are a number of policing models out there, but for the purposes of this webinar, we only wanted to look at some of those that looked at gun homicide and gun crime in the United States. So moving on to some conclusions, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. First of all, there is limited published research on the mathematics of gun violence and gun crime. And the majority of the models that are published are statistical in nature, with most using a number of different regression methods. So a number of models have analyzed the spatiotemporal spread of crime and observed the effects of population characteristics and how these population characteristics impact gun violence and gun crime but we do have fewer published studies that observe the impact of constraining gun availability and intervention attempts and their impacts. And again, this is strictly through my own personal literature review. A number of you may know of a wide variety of these studies that have been done. In terms of mathematical approaches that seem to be missing from this literature, I was unable to find models that use difference equations, partial differential equations, cellular automata models, agent-based models, and optimal control theory in order to look at gun violence and gun crime in the United States. So as 
a number of us move forward in this research. These may be a number of places where we could fill in the gaps in the research and therefore be able to grow this field in a productive way. And with that, I will gladly take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Shelby. Uh, that was a fine and quite rapid overview of a <laughs> large set of literature, uh, but not large enough for us to be able to identify um, specific answers, unfortunately, to many of the uh, issues around these horrifying uh, data and, and uh, events. So um, I'm here looking at the, uh, the chat window, and uh, now is the time if you would like to uh, chat and send a note uh, regarding either question uh, or comment um, or a suggestion on this topic, uh, feel free to do so by going in. Um, and uh, the, I, I'm, I'm going to sort of uh, summarize uh, these questions as they come in uh, and uh, let Shelby and, and I might pipe in on some of these as well. Uh, so one of the first questions is, uh, at the end, Shelby, you mentioned a number of alternative approaches. Um, and uh, this question is, well, do we actually need additional approaches? Are there some examples when the models that you've surveyed clearly did not work, um, or where some alternative approaches might be uh, beneficial? Yeah, well, that's a fantastic question. I think we have a number of tools that are available, and there are a number of characteristics of gun violence and gun crime that may have not been explored yet in the literature, and therefore it would be appropriate in order to use a number of these different approaches in order to look at gun violence and gun crime. We have these ideas behind the spatial spread and spatial distribution, but something like partial differential equation models or agent-based models have not been widely applied to these systems yet. Yes, and I'll just add that one of the reasons to do agent-based models are situations in which the more continuous um, uh, data uh, or approaches uh, may not be really appropriate. So in the case of uh, agent-based models, one can account for the impacts of rare individuals that may have uh, impact well beyond their prevalence in the population. Um, so uh, that's, that's certainly appropriate there. Um, and, uh, and, and here's, a, here's another sort of, I guess this is a question and comment. If indeed the, the data are coarse, um, as they are to some extent here because of the variety of reporting mechanisms, we did not really talk about um, the data issues associated with this. If our data are coarse, why do we need, you know, what's our need for more complex models? So I will say that along with the need for more complex models, we also need a number of more simple models. This was not simply stating that we need models with high levels of realism or high levels of complexity. We also do need these simple models. We need models that use discrete difference equations. We need models that have one or two terms. But this all comes down to the ideas of the objective of mon objectives of modeling and how we need to choose the appropriate model to answer the questions at hand. And so that may lead to a more simple model or it may lead to a more complex model. It simply depends on what questions still need to be answered in the field. And, and I will point out that there's a, uh, quite a discussion in the modeling community about these issues. It's been going on for a, a very, very long time. Um, then uh, here, here's another question. Um, can, we just, can, can you describe the current availability of data related to gun violence? So we mentioned issues associated with reporting, but I don't know if you can summarize this briefly or not, <laughs> but I'm gonna see if you can do so. In terms of that question, it depends on the type of data that you are looking for, and I cannot speak to all types of data, um, but there are some public repositories of gun violence and gun crime data that can be accessed, particularly the Chicago City Data Portal. 
and which is what I use personally in my work and a few others as well. I also know that some of the studies that have been done have used connections with local police departments and local law enforcement groups in order to help get data that may not be accessible to the public. That being said, there are a number of data collections that we maybe do not have in the field. And so something that we hope to discuss at this workshop are the data sets that we do not yet have and the data sets that we may want to encourage groups to collect. Um, and I will point out that uh, one of the comments here is that uh, data-wise, if uh, NIBRS is truly moving nationwide by 2021, it will become one of the better gun use data sets. And uh, um, they posted an uh, article uh, that I think I will uh, send to, uh, to everyone here, if I can copy and paste it, okay, uh, on that, okay. Uh, and I'm going to send that out. Uh, so that's an article I just sent to, to everyone. Um, there is a there's another question here uh, regarding um, uh, if we know if people have used internet data streams such as Twitter, Reddit, or Facebook to study gun violence. So gun violence in particular, um, in you know specifically gun violence, I have not found studies on. That being said, gang crimes have been have used data sets from internet and social media in order to uh, those data sets have been used in order to determine when the next gang crime will occur so i know that a number of studies have been done looking at gang crime and gang assault and gang, hom gang homicides gun violence in particular uh, random non-directed gun violence i do not know that there have been any studies done looking at how social media is associated with those. And, uh, and there was a follow-up about uh, contagion issues. In, uh, in other words, the use of any of those social media to analyze contagion. Is that also similarly something that you've not seen? So the social network models, I believe some of them have used uh, social media presences but there is definitely room for exploration there. Okay. Um, here's a question about uh, broken window theory. Okay, so how much weight do you think broken window theory has with gun violence, not just general crime? That's a personal opinion question. <laughs> well, okay, uh, uh, <laughs> you can answer. Yeah. It. <laughs> uh, there, there have been there have been a number of studies done in order to look at broken windows theory and whether broken windows theory policing is appropriate or not. Um, personally, I don't know enough about the data in order to answer that question. Um, I. Okay. I think that there is likely some relationship between the two, but I have not looked enough into the data to give an informed answer about that. And if anyone has, please feel free to comment and, <laughs> yeah, and post it. Uh, so that's, that may well be a topic that we would want to uh, talk about at the webinar, uh, sorry, at the, at the workshop. Um, there is a question here uh, about uh, modeling analysis of police, police involved shootings. Uh, so this is police shootings of civilians uh, in our literature review. And, and I will point out that um, uh, we have not done this personally, but one of our uh, close colleagues here at the University of Tennessee, Stephanie Bohan in the Department of Sociology, has been collaborating with one of her graduate students. They've done quite an elaborate uh, set of statistical analyses. It's, I would not necessarily call it mathematical modeling, it's statistical models, uh, to tease apart the data on police-involved shootings. Um, and uh, this, this uh, uh, question was uh, knowing what other modeling work might be out there. That is the work that I know of. This person is doing a network uh, model, a network contagion model using Chicago data. Um, and, uh, and they point out that we should be sure to include police shootings in the definition of gun violence. So I will just quote, and this is an approximate statement from a recent presentation by uh, 
uh, my colleague Stephanie Bohan that uh, approximately 1,000 um, uh, police involved shootings occur uh, each year in the US. So of the total number of um, gun violence incidents, about a thousand are uh, police involved. Uh, and, and of course, it's, it's difficult to say whether those might be, for example, um, suicides by police versus other sites. I don't know that there's any good, good data on that aspect. But, uh, but I would encourage uh, this person to look at uh, the work of Stephanie Bohan, B-O-H-O-N. And I'll add to that that, yes, that those studies were not included in this overview of the literature and that it is a specific subject that needs to be studied by the community um, and that we just don't have time to review everything all the time. So uh, that is definitely a topic that should be brought up at the workshop and should be further studied. Now, this is, uh, this is another comment that we did not really focus on here. Uh, but uh, the comment is that studies of gun violence uh, are important, but more studies are needed of public attitudes towards gun violence. Um, so public atti attitudes drive policy uh, via pressure on legislators to either pass more restrictive or more lenient gun legislation. Um, so uh, I, I would hope that at the workshop, we will talk a bit about the variety of models uh, for human behavior uh, that might go along with this uh, approach. I don't know that we've actually seen any of those models in this literature. For example, Shelby, have you seen anything that uses the theory of planned behavior from social psychology? There, there are some studies that have been done looking at planned behavior. Um, they were not specifically for gun crime and gun violence, but there have been some models that have looked at planned behavior. Uh, that being said, there are not enough. Uh, at the moment, my, my attitude is that there's never enough research on this subject. So if anyone would like to take that on, I completely support you. Um, in terms of adjusting public views about gun violence and gun crime, I also think that that is very important. And the idea behind modeling how the public feels about gun violence and gun crime is a very interesting and complex issue. So I do hope that we discuss that and think about how we can use some of the existing data and some new models and potentially even new data in order to determine how we can best drive policy. Okay. Um, so there's, I, this is another sort of question about the data, okay? Um, and this person says, I, I can imagine that the data are simply something like number of crimes of a particular type per area and some metadata a gun or type or people involved. Is there more to it than this? And, and if there is, what is it? In other words, what are the kinds of data that, that you see and, and whether that's it or whether there's others? So I'll speak specifically to my experience with the Chicago City crime data set. And in that there is information about the crime that occurred, where and when it occurred, um, and then some more information about the arrest and about the community area, which community areas are specific to Chicago. Um, meanwhile, the Gun Violence Archive takes into account the news stories that are produced about the given gun violence events. So while the Chicago City data set only can give information about the crime itself, not necessarily the perpetrators or the victims, the Gun Violence Archive data sets allow you to look at the victims and the perpetrator information as it's reported by different news sites. Um, so that again comes down to whether the data that we have can be fully trusted and how we take into account the ways in which we get the data. I also know of data such as the Acoustic Gunshot Locator Services in Washington, D.C., and um, a number of other technologies that are out there, like ShotSpotter, that can help determine where gunshots are being fired. 
So there are a number of different data sets out there that are not just the number of crimes or the types of crimes or the general locations. Uh, we do have some good information out there and good access to a number of these different data sets. Um, but that's not to say that they are complete and that's not to say that we have all of the data necessary in order to carry, in order to answer all of the questions we have. Okay. Um, and let's see if there's anything else here. Um, I think I have come to the end of the set of questions here. Uh, but let's see, I think something else just came in. Ah, um, this is um, uh, a question about spatio-temporal models of violence need to incorporate both environmental effects that change only slowly and also rapidly changing dynamics such as network analysis. So are there any models that basically, I, I think this is asking if they operate on two time scales. Are there multi-scale modeling ones that incorporate um, environmental effects that change slowly and other ones that change more rapidly, uh, such as network interactions? I have not seen any multi-scale models. Uh, that would be a fantastic and incredibly cool uh, model in order to create. I think incorporating these environmental conditions is very important and that we have to think of environment not only as the uh, you know external factors like weather um, or uh, you know temperature and rainfall and things like that, but we also have to think about the environment within the areas that do change on slower timescales. So things like uh, political norms and things like the uh, you know greening of vacant lots. Uh, there was a study done in Youngstown, Ohio. They looked at how taking these vacant lots and turning them into green spaces affected the amount of crime in a given area. So if we have programs like that going on, we need to think about how that environmental change affects the spread of gun crime and gun violence in a given area. So that's definitely something to be taken into consideration. And I have not yet seen a multi-scale model done. Okay. So there's a new dissertation for someone. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe several dissertations. Yeah, someone else take that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I again, um, I have not seen another new question pop up. Um, I'm going to take a quick run through here and see if I've missed anything. Um, no. So, um, if you have a uh, another question or a comment, uh, please uh, do feel free to. To post it. We have a few more minutes. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if I don't see anything pop up in the next couple minutes, we'll, we'll close this out. I want to remind everyone that um, the workshop website, which is on the screen right now, um, uh, will have a posting that includes the slides from this webinar as well as the questions that have come in through the through the uh, chat and the question box, uh, and it will uh, also have a list of references that um, we have not put up here on the <laughs> on there. There's about I think five or six slides of references that Shelby has put together associated with with this, but we'll they will be included in the uh, set of slides that are posted. It will take us a, a couple of days to get those posted, particularly because I think Friday is a um, official holiday for the university. Uh, but we expect that we'll have that all posted by uh, the beginning of next week. And um, with regard to the workshop itself, uh, there will also be some parts of the workshop that will be live streamed, uh, particularly at the beginning on the first day on May 1st. Uh, and you are, they are open to, uh, to people to watch. Uh, much of the workshop will be in uh, breakout sessions that we don't have any effective way to, to stream uh, because they're focused on uh, interactions in small groups. Uh, but uh, we really appreciate uh, your uh, willingness to participate in this webinar. And uh, being as I don't see any other questions at this point, I think I'm going to uh, 
to close it off. Um, and uh, I'll just end by, by thanking um, Shelby for devoting so much time and energy to thinking about this webinar and, uh, and to all of you for participating. And I look forward to uh, seeing many of you who will be attending the uh, gathering here in a few weeks. So thank you very much. Um, uh, have a good rest of the day.